friends, and welcome to another edition of the Sabbath School Study Hour. My name is Pastor Sean Brummond, and uh, it is my privilege to be able to teach uh, you this lesson study right here from the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh-day Adventist Church in the greater Sacramento area of California. But before we open with prayer and before we get into our study here today, I want to invite you to take advantage of a special free gift offer that we have for you here today as well. So if you are living in North America and you would like a, a, a hard copy of this particular uh, uh, free gift, it's called Blood Behind the Veil. And all you need to do is call 1-866-788-3966 and ask for free offer number 130. That's one three. Zero, And you can see that number on the screen as well. Now, if you're in the USA and you'd like to just get a digital copy of this, as more people are looking for as well on your phone to be able to even read it on the fly, you can go ahead and text the code SH154. And you want to text that to the number 405. Four, four. That'll hook you up to a link that will get you a free digital download of this uh, very helpful uh, uh, track and uh, booklet. And uh, now if you're in somewhere else in, in the world, outside of the U.S., outside of North America, you'd still like to be able to get your hands on this or at least a digital access to this, you can go to the Amazing Facts website, which is at uh, which is at study.aftv.org front slash sh one five four and, uh, and that'll get you if you have internet any ex- access anywhere in the world we'll be happy to get that into your hands for free well friends before we study we're going to do what we always do each and every week and we're going to pray for the lord's blessing and teaching father we want to thank you so much for your love towards us we thank you that you have given us your word we thank you that you have helped us to be able to understand your word as your holy spirit comes to us as our teacher We want to claim that and that promise even right now that when we ask and when we seek that you will give us the spirit and he will guide us into all truth. Please guide us now and bless each friend that's watching. In Jesus' name I pray these things, God. Amen. Okay, friends, again, we are coming to lesson number 10 in this uh, uh, quarter's quarterly. And um, again, it's entitled Mission to the Unreached. And the memory text is from Acts 17, verse 24. And we're going to get to that as we read through the actual chapter. But I'm just excited about the very next verse that is shared with us on Sabbath, uh, on Sabbath lesson, which is page 80. And that is uh, Acts 17 and verse 17. And uh, let's go ahead and read that together. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Acts 17, verse 17, or your quarterly also has it recorded there as well. And it says this, it says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Now, friends, I find that that particular verse, right in the middle of the chapter that we're going to spend our entire time studying here today, is just a powerful summary of the entire chapter. And and that is Paul's time in Athens was spent predominantly in the Sabbath, with the Jews and with the Jewish converts, uh, reasoning from the scripture, showing Jesus as the Messiah, but also most of the days during the week, he found himself at least making one trip to the marketplace and also reasoning with the Athenians there, the different pagans, the heathen, those who are outside of any kind of Jewish knowledge of the Bible or belief in it, but rather was wrapped up in a lot of different idolatry and other versions of religion and philosophies. Also on uh, Sabbath's opening there, there's a couple of um, introductory sentences that I think are very helpful for us. It says, naturally, Paul would have been more, most comfortable working among the Jews, his own flesh and blood. He is very much like you and I. But Paul refused to be satisfied with working only among his own people. He had been called to reach others as well. Gentiles, by the way, is a word that we don't use outside of Bible language. Unless we're talking about the Bible, we typically don't call somebody that's a non-Jewish person a Gentile. You know, and the reason I stop sometimes to explain these things is because, you know, I came from ground zero when I came to the Lord and to the Bible. And, and so when I was starting to fellowship with Christians in their homes and for lunches or socials and so on, they would talk sometimes use the term Gentiles. And I was oblivious. What is in the world is a Gentile. 
Well, Gentile is a biblical term that is referring to anybody that's not non-Jewish by race. And, uh, and so, of course, Paul was a Jew. He would feel most comfortable in a synagogue. He had grown up worshiping and going to Sabbath school in a synagogue. And so working amongst those people, he'd be the most comfortable. Then we come to the last sentence of Sabbath's introductory page there, and it says, How did Paul go about seeking to reach these people, and what can we learn from his attempts? And so we want to see the how he did it, and what can we learn from that in order for us to be better witnesses? Because, of course, the Acts of Apostles, as different preachers have said over the years, is an open book. It doesn't, hasn't come to its end yet. Now, yes, there is a certain amount of chapters, and it does come to an end as far as the printed sacred part, as Luke had recorded it in the book of Acts. But uh, the Acts of the Christians and the church continued far beyond, and even is continuing today and will continue until until Jesus comes. And so we want to say to ourselves, how can we fulfill our part of being a Apostle Paul and bring the gospel to our neighbors, to our city, to our country, or perhaps some other country around the world, even as Paul was called to be a missionary far away from his homeland in Israel. So that's what we're looking at here today. Of course, Paul is found fulfilling God's plan for him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. It's interesting, he was very unique as the last one called to be an apostle, but also the only one that was listed to be the official ambassador and apostle to ex- almost exclusively serve the, 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 the non-Jewish population, the Gentiles. Now, of course, there's some overlap between the two because Paul also preached and reasoned with Jews in the synagogues and the various cities of the Roman Empire in which he was working, as well as in Jerusalem. Um, So it's not exclusive, but predominantly with the Gentiles. Even as Peter was called to be the apostle to the Jews, but was also found in Rome in his last years and sadly was crucified in Rome as a martyr, um, as he was not only serving the Jews that were there, but he was also involved in missionary activity for the non-Jewish population as well. You know, there's some interesting verses that we can find. The first one in Acts 22 and verse 21, where it says, Then he said to me, that is Jesus, and this is Paul recalling a conversation that he had previously had with Jesus. He said, Then he, that is Jesus, said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And that was the first indication. And by the way, that was the same day that Jesus had appeared to Paul and knocked him on his horse when he was on the way to uh, Damascus. Then in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul writes later, he says, For he, and again, that's Jesus and God, who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, that is, circumcised is another reference to the Jews, also effectively worked in me toward the Gentiles. And then in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13, he goes on and says, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. And so when Paul wrote to the Roman church, before he was, ever able, he was ever able to visit them, he also had uh, indicated that he was called by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And, uh, and so he had a God-given burden to be able to reach that particular population, even though he started in a local Jewish synagogue, because, of course, that was the most effective and quickest and most efficient way to be able to start to establish the truth of Jesus Christ being the Messiah of the world and the Savior of mankind and the Savior also of the Jews. He would start there to lay a foundation. Um, sometimes they received it gladly, and sometimes the majority of them were very aggressive and violent in their rejection of that truth. And, uh, and Paul would respond accordingly in the different cities and contexts. Uh, but uh, he'd also had a very clear burden, not just to stay in the synagogue, but also to reach that non-Jewish population that was represented by a number of different philo- philosophical worldviews, religious worldviews, and otherwise. Now, of course, Paul was way ahead of his time, and many of his fellow Jewish Christians within the church, because this is very controversial, because Jews were raised to say, to think that they were this exclusive club that were the descendants of Abraham. They had a free automatic ticket to heaven, and if you really tried extra hard, there's some peripheral Gentiles on the outside that might make it into heaven, but otherwise, uh, Jews were the superior uh, 
religious race in the, in the world and in their view. Now, of course, God had to sort that out and correct that within his new church as God had, had transferred the church of Israel as a geographical country to that of a non-geographical nation and uh, kingdom, which is the church, and, um, and be able to help them to understand that this borderless church was to include members across the world to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people even as Jesus had commissioned them when he, just before he ascended back to his Father in heaven, and baptize them and make disciples of all nations across the world. And so Paul followed his regular uh, operandi. Uh, when he entered into the city of Athens for the first time, and as far as the record goes, this is the first time Paul had ever stepped foot in this great city. Now, when he stepped foot into Athens, of course, this was no small experience in no small city because Athens was a very famous, very prestigious city in Paul's time. Athens was a city that was made up of, of, uh, of some of the world's greatest thinkers, philosophers, some of the most respected artists and poets, um, intellectuals, uh, PhD uh, was a very common, if we can call it that, uh, their equivalent of a PhD uh, was uh, much more common uh, found among the population of Athenians. They were highly educated, highly intelligent people, and they had uh, nurtured that in, in a very uh, serious way. And so that's the context that Paul was entering into when he came into the city of uh, Athens. Well, let's open our Bibles itself and go to the book of Acts. We're going to Acts chapter 17, and uh, we're just going to quickly run through the first several verses of that. And so we're going to Acts chapter 17, and we're going to start with verse 1. And the question is asked in the first days of our quarterly study, how and how did Paul find himself in Athens in the first place? So we want to look at the greater context. And it says, now when they had passed through Am- Amphipolis and, Ap- and Apollonia, They came to Thessalonica, which there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then Paul, as his custom was, went went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. And so Paul would show up to church each week on Sabbath, what we call Saturday today, to reason from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. Now, Christ is the, is the Greek version uh, and Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. And both of them mean the anointed one. And so when he says, the Jesus that I preached to you is the Christ, he's saying, this is the Jewish Messiah that was promised. Verse 4, he goes, and some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. And so they won their first Uh, Christians and people to the faith here in verse 4. Verse 5, it says, But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Jason obviously is a one of these first converts that accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior and he's finding himself um, being hospitable. In verse 6, it says, And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren, that is, some fellow believers, to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So we come to one of the most famous verses in the book of Acts, and uh, certainly it's one that speaks volumes because it tells us that Paul and Silas and his missionary team had a reputation that had preceded their arrival for the first time, by the way, in the city of Thessalonica in northern Greece, of what we call northern Greece today. And so they cry out, these are the men that have turned our world upside down, and now they've come to do the same thing here in our city of Thessalonica. Jason has harbored them, and these all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Now, Berea is about 50 miles down the road, almost straight west from Thessalonica. 
And uh, when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Again, this is the main operational uh, uh, procedure that Paul would, and, his, and his fellow missionaries would fall, follow. Verse 11, it says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now, friends, wouldn't that be wonderful if Paul ran into that kind of uh, group every city that he went into? Now, we know that, of course, the people in Berea uh, were much different in total contrast to the Jews, or the majority of the Jews, at least, that were found in the city of Thessalonica. And uh, so, you know, as an evangelist, one who has uh, uh, preached many times over the years the gospel and the end-time message from the Bible to many people over the years, every time I read this, I said, oh, how wonderful it would be if every crowd that gathered to hear a prophecy seminar would respond in this way. Verse 12, it says, therefore, many of them, you see, because their mindset and their attitude was one of an open mind, not to anything that might come floating their way, but their final authority was the scriptures. You see, the Berean Jews had made that vital conclusion that it's important for you and I and for everybody that we are winning to Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior is that this book called the Bible and the words that are written in it is the final authority concerning religious truth. It is higher than my authority as a pastor. It is higher than my church's authority as a church. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear and it's important for us to understand as Christians that the levels of authority is God first, then the scriptures, then the church, and then the pastors and the evangelists and leaders of the church and so on. And, uh, and so the Bereans had their proper view of the scriptures. Tradition didn't come first. The church didn't come first. The synagogue didn't come first. The local priest didn't come first. The local rabbi wasn't their final authority. Their final authority was the word of God. And friends, that's the only safe place you can can ever be found when it comes to religious matters. And so in verse 12, it says, Therefore many, not a few, but many of them believed, and also a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. And so the gospel is not one that only reaches those in the lower classes of society throughout history or across America, but it reaches some of the most highest, most prestigious and prominent citizens of America and of history. Uh, Scientific, politicians, Friends, it's amazing when you look at history, the, 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 the spectrum. There is no spectrum of society or intellect or of wealth that the gospel is not able to reach and has reached across the world. Verse 13, it says, And when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came also and stirred up the crowds. And so the people in Thessalonica, unfortunately, the Jews there were so corrupt that they found themselves even traveling 50 miles down the road to arrive in Berea when they heard word that Paul and Silas and his team were also bringing the same truth to the Bereans, and the Bereans were responding so positively. In verse 14, it says, Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away and to go to the sea, obviously to get on a boat, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens. And received a command for Silas and Timothy to come with him, to him, with all speed, and they departed. Now, we have to remember that the trip to, from Thessalonica to Berea, again, is about 50 miles. So we're talking, you know, a couple days walk for, you know, fit ancient times when you walked everywhere and you're much more fit than we are today. But to go from from Berea down to Athens is to move from the very northern parts of modern Greece to the very southern tip. And so that was a longer journey and uh, certainly would have taken them uh, the better part of a week, if not a whole week or more. And, uh, and now we have Paul decides to send those who conducted and helped him down there uh, to send word when to return, of course, back to their city of Berea and give word to Timothy and Silas to, to send them to join Paul and uh, so they can continue their work. Well, poor Paul, he's left alone in a city he's never been in, and it's not a Jewish city. He's far from Israel. He's far from his own culture, his own language, his home religion, and so on. And uh, and he's all alone. And friends, some of you know by experience that to do missionary work alone is not an easy thing, especially when there's there's no one you know, and you don't know how the local Jews even are going to respond in the synagogue. Verse 16 goes on and says, Now Paul, while he waited for them at Athens, 
Now again, you have to remember, the messengers have to go all the way back up to Berea, give word to Timothy and Silas to come back down and join Paul. Then T- Timothy and Silas has to take the better part of a week, if not more, to join Paul. And so this could be two plus weeks before Paul is going to have his fellow colleagues join him. But Paul, like always, is not letting the time go to waste. No, it says that his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. And so there's an immediate burden that Paul experiences when he enters and walks through this famous city. Now, he must have been anticipating and heard word and even in his education learned about uh, the, the, the likes of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and so on that, that, that lived and, and, and gained such a big famous reputation because Paul was one who would have our modern equivalent of a PhD in his educational resu- uh, uh, resume. And uh, so I'm sure he was familiar with these individuals. He was familiar and learnt about Athens. But now as he walks through it, he is overwhelmed by, even in spite of all the intellect, all of the education, all of the knowledge, all of the talent in this think tank of a city, that, uh, that they were reduced in their foolishness um, of actually believing that statutes statues that are that are formed from the hands of men in silver and gold and wood and rock and so on could actually have some kind of deity some kind of supernatural literal power even though it can't move without men picking it up and moving it it can't talk can't hear it can't smell has no brain that's actually working no real communication that they really hear and uh, and some of these deities of course were reflections of nature and different creatures and different individuals of ma- mankind and mythical figures and so on. And, and so as Paul points out in the first chapter of Romans, you know, to be an idolater is really to play the fool. You're, you're being tricked. And so Paul is overcome by this irony, this paradox that, that he is viewing amongst these, these intellectual giants. And... Um, and that's where we pick it up, and that's the context of what led Paul there as he's making this tour through what we call today modern Greece for the very first time. Yeah, let's read verse 17 as we did for our introductory verse. It says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue of the Jews and of the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. And so Paul is finding himself, again, as I said earlier, not only in the Jewish synagogue from Sabbath to Sabbath, but he's not making waste of the days in between, but he's applying that burden to, these, to this intellectual, very talented, accomplished uh, population that is playing the fool with idolatry and doesn't know the true God of heaven, yet alone that Jesus is the Christ that must have suffered, died, and rose to glory as our high priest and forgiver of our sins and so on. And, uh, and so he knows that they are much more far gone even than his fellow Jews in the local synagogue. And so he finds himself in the marketplace. Now, it's interesting in Europe, and I've only been to Europe once just this last March, and I was in Turkey, and, and, uh, and most of that is in Asia Minor. But uh, then as you get to Constantinople, the, half of that's the, first, the last half of that city on the west side is actually in Europe. And then after that, shortly after you leave Constantinople, you go west, you find yourself at the borders of Greece. And so I was able to uh, look at some biblical sites uh, that Paul would have been working, uh, both in Thessalonica, as we've just read, as well as in Athens, as well as in Corinth, as well as Berea. And uh, so those are all kind of a little bit fresh in my mind because it was just this last March that I was able to be there. But I didn't really live in Europe, per se. I was a tourist still. I was there for educational tour, but I was still a tourist. And so I never really lived with the residents, but I've been told that even today, as they have for hundreds of years, Europeans still make it a practice to find themselves at the grocery store, at the marketplace, on a daily basis, buying their food for that day. I'm sure they still have a fridge and some, maybe a freezer or something like that, but much different from what I've been told than that of us here in America, Canada, and such as is we fill our freezers, you know, and we fill our fridge and our pantries and we grocery shop sometimes only once or twice a week or sometimes only every two weeks. Um, but Europeans are a little bit different and uh, certainly it would have been the same even more so back then because they had no option of a fridge, no option of a freezer. And so to be in the marketplace daily, buying their daily food and uh, vegetables, fruits, breads, and so on was a commonplace practice. Uh, 
And so Paul wasn't in the marketplace by coincidence. He needed to be there himself to buy his daily food. Uh, But not only that, he also understood that all the rest of the population also would find themselves at least uh, representing their family. One member of the family there on a regular daily basis. And so he would start to see the same faces over and over from day to day at that spot as well. And, uh, and, and Paul also is on record because later on in his Oropagus, uh, count, uh speech that he makes to the Oropagus Council, he reveals that indeed that uh, he had spent substantial time touring uh, the city of Athens. So yes, he reasoned and started up conversations and brought in religious into his conversations in the marketplace on a daily basis, but he also spent some substantial time taking his alone time touring the city, studying the local temples, studying the local idols and, and what they represent, the art, the, the poems, the reading some of the literature that was famous and revered by the local Athenians. There's a quote on page 81 that I think is helpful for us on Sunday's lesson. And, uh, and it says this, and this is right in the middle of the, uh, of the page in the third, beginning of the third paragraph. It says, Paul therefore frequented the marketplace where these people uh, were to be found. He might say, we might say that he formed the first global mission study center where he used the marketplace to study and test methods of reaching the hearts and minds of these pagans. You see, Paul was brought up a Jew. He could talk with a Jew. He could have an intellectual, religious or philosophical um, conversation with a Jew. And, uh, and he understood how they, how they thought, how they acted, what they spoke what their traditions were. Not so with the Athenians. This was a totally different animal, totally different species of people. And, uh, and so he spent, inevitably, spent some substantial time studying this during his time in Athens. He was looking for a starting point in winning these pagans. Uh, he knew that the starting point needed to be different than that of the, uh, of the local Jewish population. He could walk into a Jewish synagogue and they were very familiar with the truths, those foundational truths found in Genesis chapter one and two and three, the creation of the world in six days, the, the, the blessing and, the, and, and God setting aside as sacred and holy the seventh day Sabbath and, and such. They were very familiar with that. They were familiar with the fall and the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and Adam and Eve's being the mother and father of all mankind and how God created God, man in his own image. They were all familiar with those truths. They were familiar with the Ten Commandments and the moral code that God gave to mankind and to the Jewish nation for the world in Exodus chapter 20. These foundational truths were already very much alive and well in the minds of the Jewish population, but not so with the pagan population, which made up the biggest portion of the population of Athens. Now, of course, that's not just unique to, um, to Athens and to ancient Greece, but it's also very unique to modern Greece. Uh, modern Greece, of course, has a strong, long-standing Christian heritage. You know, you have the Christian Orthodox Church that stems all the way back to about 1000 AD. And then, of course, before that, the Universal Church out of Rome. It's, you know, so Christianity is, Greece has been exposed to Christianity for a long time, very much like America has been exposed to Christianity for a very long time. And there used to be a time, you know, back in the 1950s, when 50% of all Americans would find themselves in church every single week. And uh, now, of course, we know that that is not the case. Uh, 1970s, it dropped to, we're looking at round numbers, dropped to 40%. And, uh, and now in 2023, it's approximately 30% of Americans are attending church on a regular basis. And so we are on the decline. And uh, church attending Christians are the very small minority. We're less than a third of all Americans today. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, I would say that America has arrived at a context that is very familiar, very similar, I should say, to that of Athens and ancient Greece in Paul's day. And uh, I'm a living product of the decisions of the previous generations that decided to reject church, reject the Bible, reject religion altogether, including Christianity. And my parents did that when I was two. I have no recollection of ever going to church in my growing years because of that. And so my parents had made a decision at that point to go 100% secular. And so I had no exposure to God, no exposure to the Bible, church, Jesus. I knew nothing 
When I was 20 years of age, friends, I was at ground zero on all those points. And uh, so were the Athenians that Paul was trying to reach. And uh, so how did he do it? How, can, how did he reach them, and how can we reach our secular neighbors today? Well, let's continue on in verses 18 through 21 as we read the record here. In 18, it says, verse 18, it says, Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? And so some of them, and again, these are, uh, these are prestigious philosophical leaders within these different camps and, and uh, of understanding of philosophies. Epicurean was one philosophy. Stoicism was another one. And there were different people that parked in these different philosophical camps. And, uh, and so they looked down their nose at Paul and they said, who is this babbler? What does he want to say? Now, babbler literally means in the original Greek and Aramaic in which they were speaking was, was mid seat picker. And uh, so when they called him a seed picker, this was a slang or a term that they used back in the day to be able to refer to those who were bums. They were living off the streets, living off the scraps that people left on the streets. And uh, so they weren't being productive. They certainly weren't intellectual. They certainly weren't educated on any kind of college or university level. Uh, They looked down upon Paul as a bum. Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. And so they started to pick up, okay, he's talking about foreign religion and foreign gods that we've never heard of because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And so what is Jesus preaching? Well, he's preaching and he's able to have intellectual conversations with them concerning, you know, the Stoic viewpoint and philosophies, the Epicurean philosophies, the philosophy of Plato and Socrates. He could have an intellectual conversation. He probably did with some of them concerning the viewpoints of these different philosophical camps and viewpoints. But what we want to pick up here, and we don't want to lose out on this, is that he was preaching the gospel of Jesus and the resurrection. Now, when he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection, that means he's preaching the crucifixion of Jesus, and he's also preaching the following resurrection of Jesus. And the good news that that brings to us and why that's good news. But of course, this is so foreign. It's not all sinking in. They're trying to connect the dots. They're confused. They're a little bit concerned. If you read one of my favorite books called The Acts of the Apostles, you'll find there that that Paul, you know, is actually endangering his life by doing this. Because some of the Epicurean and uh, Stoic uh, opposers that are obviously opposing him and belittling him, they actually started to to threaten him a little bit and say, listen, you know, don't forget what started, happened to Socrates. Socrates was a great man, a great philosopher, famous Greek person of history, but, you know, eventually he ended up, uh, you know, he had to take back some poison and, and he lost his life because he, he crossed a boundary and started to bring in things outside of our philosophical camps and myths and, and traditions and so on. And so he got himself in hot water, lost his life, and you might too if you don't be careful. Well, as they continued to observe him and some of the highest, most important council members of the city of Athens, which is known as the Oropagus, they eventually became convinced that he's not going to give up. And, uh, and so finally they say to him, in verse 8, 19, it says, And they took him and brought him to the Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and therefore we want to know, we want to know what these things mean. Verse 21 goes on and says, For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some kind of good news, or new news, I should say. And, uh, and so finally, the most prestigious and most important and powerful figures of the city of Athens in Paul's time uh, invite him for a hearing. Now, I used to think in times past that the Oropagus, in my first readings of this year's past, was that the Oropagus was, I knew it was a place, a famous meeting place where the philosophical thinkers would come, but I thought it was just more of a think tank and a place to kind of bounce off your ideas and share new philosoph- philosophical insights with each other. But as it turns out, uh, as, the, as the quarterly also points out, it was actually a very organized council of government. And, uh, and they would take hearings on a criminal count at times as a judicial body. And then they would also consider new religious ideas as well. 
And so even though this wasn't a legal hearing, there was no crime in which Paul was guilty of, this was an official appointment. This was not, you know, hey, we're having a think tank again tomorrow afternoon. Why don't you come and join us and bounce it off us? No, they are saying, listen, this is serious stuff, you know. And again, remember what happened to Socrates. We, we need to know what this is all about. And we're going to bring you before the most powerful, most highly achieved and intellectual council that we have in the city. And so Paul finds himself standing before this very prestigious group of people. So I would like to share a picture with you of, uh, as I shared earlier, I actually had the privilege of uh, traveling through modern Greece and, uh, and seeing the Oropagus myself for the first time. So the Oropagus has two applications. Number one, it applies to the council that I just explained in regards to the actual men that it's made up of. And then also uh, the place in which their council is named off of. And uh, so if you're up on the Acropolis, which is a generic term for the highest point in an in a ancient city or a European city, in this case where the Parthenon is located, the famous Parthenon, the most famous archaeological site, I would say, in all of Europe. And then you look down the stairs as you're going up to the Parthenon, you look behind you, you can see center picture there on your screen, a picture of the Oropagus, or Mars Hill, as it's also legitimately called, uh, which is uh, kind of an ev evolved word and term from uh, the Hill of uh, Ayres, or Ayres Hill, A-R-E-S. And Ayres is actually a Greek mythological god of war that is said in one of its myths to be on trial from the other gods, mythological Greek gods, uh, for murdering, murdering the son of another god. And, uh, and that trial is said to take place on that rock. So you can see that outcropping of a rock. And so you can see why they would cho choose it to represent something mythological, because it kind of has a mythological kind of uh, uh, take to it in the fact that it just kind of shoots out of the ground uh, from almost all sides and, uh, and then has a fairly large uh, platform on top. It, it's very primitive and very untouched and natural. And so every time I used to read this chapter, I used to envision Paul speaking in this really nice, nice, beautiful, you know, Athenian uh, pillars and marble floors and nice staircase, you know, seating, stadium style seating where the Oropagus, you know, people were, were listening to Paul's speech. But no, it turns out that Paul and the people who were there on this very natural, untouched, there's no archaeological evidence whatsoever, um, according to the experts, as well as my personally being there, of any kind of man-made pillars or any of that kind. And, uh, and so it wasn't so much the spot being famous and prestigious because of its architecture, uh, but rather because of its mythological heritage, uh, starting with the myth of this uh, Greek god of Eris, the Greek god of war, and then later on uh, some of the big count criminal uh, uh, trials and so on that took place there. And so it has this deep, rich history, even to the point where it's thought of with some dread even by the local Athenians in Paul's time. And so it was no small place in the, in the heritage of it, the history of it. But when you get there, it's like, this is it? You know, um, but nevertheless, it is very interesting. And I got a closer up picture there and the effects on my phone camera somehow uh, maybe made some lines on the rocks that are interesting there. But uh, nevertheless, you can see that, you know, and, and of course, I'm not there because I'm taking the picture from up near the Parthenon. But um, yeah, that's it. That's where the actual speech took place. Mars Hill, Hill of Eris or Eris Hill or um, the Oropagus. Well, let's continue on. Um, oh, oh, there's a quote by, there, by the way, I'd like to um, share um, also on page um, 82. And this comes from one of my favorite books on this speech and on the book of Acts. It's called The Acts of the Apostle by Ellen White. It says, The wisest of his hearers were astonished. They listened to his reasoning. He showed himself familiar with their works of art, their literature, and their religion. And, uh, and then later on, at the very bottom of that same quarterly page on Monday's lesson, it says um, that uh, Paul later on, after Athens' experience, his next stop was another major city of ancient Greece, which is uh, Corinth. And uh, when he was there, he later wrote in the uh, first chapter or two of 1 Corinthians, the first letter that he wrote to his church there um, in later years, that when he was among them, he determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified.
And so he tempered a little bit more the philosophical logic kind of approach that he used with the Athenians and, and moved a little bit more with Christ and him crucified almost more exclusively. Um, not to say that Jesus didn't preach Christ and him crucified in Athens, because I think that sometimes we have falsely concluded that. But really, really, if you park in this chapter long enough, again, as I pointed out in verse 18, at the end there, he says he preached in the marketplace Jesus and the resurrection. Now, friends, you can't preach the resurrection of Jesus unless you first preach the crucifixion of Jesus. And so, uh, obviously, Jesus was being, and him crucified, was also a very big part of his message to the Athenians, but it wasn't as big as later on when he got to the city of Corinth. And what a contrast, by the way. The city of Corinth was like the Las Vegas of his ancient times. You know, people there were just prostitution. and It was a sailor's uh, town, and... Uh, and uh, so prostitution was a massive industry there, uh, tied in with idolatry, the, the goddess of Venus and so on. And uh, so whenever a ship came in full of sailors, uh, you know, the, 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 all these temple prostitutes would come stream down the hillside where the temple was and, and, uh, and ply their trade uh, for these sailors and for the general population. And so education wasn't really part of their gig, but Athens certainly was. And so Paul was meeting them as best as he could in the way that they understood. And so before we run out of time, I do want to make our way through the actual uh, sermon. We need to understand that, like so many other times in the Bible, including Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching and so on, his sermon, these are just brief summaries. This is a kind of a condensed version of the actual sermons that these men were sharing, because it obviously wasn't the whole speech, because it would be the shortest sermon in all of history. You know, I wouldn't actually timed it. I said, how long would it take me to reasonably read if I was actually preaching this? And I even slowed it down a little bit just to be on the conservative side. How long would it take me if I was Paul? And these were all the words that he shared. How long would his speech be? And it came to a minute and 40 seconds. And, uh, and so to me, that tells me that very obviously this is a condensed summary of what Paul shared with the Athenians but God knew it would be beneficial for you and I. And so we read it. Verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. And so as some of the later days in our lesson study point out, we want to pick up that Paul was not disparaging the people of Athenians. He didn't come in as some kind of self-made expert and said, well, listen, you guys are fools. You're playing the fool. You're, you're worshiping these silly idols when they can't see, they can't think, they can't move. They can't do nothing without you moving them and, uh, and such. And I've got a way more superior way than you will ever be able to imagine. No. He doesn't disparage their religion or their viewpoint, but he shows that he cares for them. He has great and deep respect for them as his fellow human beings. And in this case, also fellow PhDs, if we could say it that way. And, uh, and so he's speaking their language, and he's also doing it in, very, in a very respectful way. And he's finding as much as common as he possibly can, as much positive as he can, as he uses that to bridge them over in the most innocuous way he can over to the true God and the true message of the gospel. And he does it in a very effective way, I believe. All right, so men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through, I saw this inscription to an altar, even to the unknown God. They didn't, they want to make sure all their bases were covered. In case there was a God they had not yet learned or known about, they even want to make sure they worship and give allegiance to him. Therefore, the one for whom you worship not knowing, him I proclaim to you. Do you see that ingenious bridge? Verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And so do you see what Paul is doing here? He's giving, he's bringing them through a Bible study on Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And, uh, and he continues as we'll continue on through this particular sermon. 
And, and friends, you know, again, from somebody like myself that was a ground zero, the first time I stepped in church, I'd never read Genesis. I, I had no idea that there was a God in heaven that made all life, you know, in six literal days. You know, I, I went through the secular high school system. My biology taught me from, teacher taught me right from grade eight on. I remember my first biology teacher in class in grade eight, and he started to introduce to me Darwin's theory of evolution and, and talked about how, you know, we don't know yet exactly, but all the right ingredients were in this primordial soup and primordial soup. And there was this lightning flash and, and the energy that came from the lightning as we we're speculating and, and such, you know, brought life to this first very primitive one celled organism that eventually evolved over millions of years to the sophisticated species of the world, including you and I. That's the only theory that I was ever exposed to. And, uh, and so these men that he's speaking to are very much in that way as well. Now, they didn't believe in evolution. They didn't have Darwin, hadn't come along for a long time after that. But they were taught that we came together and you read some of these old ancient mythological beliefs that the Greeks and other peoples had tied in with their idols and false gods. And it's very bizarre and, and very foolish sounding and silly ways in which they believe that life came to the planet. And so Paul is here giving them a Bible study on Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and they don't even know it. I needed that as well. And then we go on in verse 26, and he said, He's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and is determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries and their dwellings. Now, friends, this speaks volumes again. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God determines within the Trinity as they speak amongst themselves that we will make the final species in our own image. We will create man in the image of God. And Paul here is bringing them through that same truth, that fundamental foundational Bible truth. And, um, and he says, listen, all of us share the same great, 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 great grandfather and mother. Their names are Adam and Eve. Now, I don't know if he actually shared their names during this. Probably not. But again, this is a condensed version of his sermon. But he says, all of us come from the same family tree. All of us same, share the ultimate same father and mother on an earthly basis and then the same heavenly father on a creation basis in concern to our origins. And not only that, but it also points out in verse 26, much of what the rest of the Old Testament reveals, including the rest of the chapters of Genesis, is that after God did create all the life forms, and after he did create mankind in his own image, through one man, one woman, that then procreated and populated the earth, that he also has decided and has been very much involved in the workings of mankind and is sovereign over all and is caring over all mankind all through history. Now, again, this is a very fundamental, redundant truth for you and I as church-going Christians, if you are one. Uh, but for these people, this is revolutionary, even as it was for me many years ago. And God also is sovereign to the point where he determines the pre-appointed times in which people live. He determines how long you will live. He determines how long a nation will survive, when it will be conquered by another nation. He lifts up presidents and he brings down presidents. He lifts up kings and he brings down kings. We find that in Daniel chapter 2 and we find it in Daniel chapter 4. Several times in Daniel, God very clearly tells us that God is in charge of the the nations and how long they are there, and he is in charge of who will lead those nations and when and how. Verse 27 goes on and says, so that all of this he gives, gives a foundation to lead to one of the most important truths, in fact, the most important truth in verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And so now Paul is introducing a loving God that not only determines the kings and nations and the times of those kings and nations, but now he's also saying that God does all of this in order that you might find a living, personal, saving relationship with the God of the universe. And so now Paul is introducing a loving God, a God that cares so much that he is doing everything with his sovereignty and with his almighty power to be able to bring every single individual into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, with himself. 
Verse 28 goes on and says, And in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And so now he's quoting either from his previous education in uh, Tarsus, where he was uh, educated from one of the most prestigious Jewish rabbis and teachers of his day, or it was because he was uh, had learned this and had read it while he was touring through uh, Athens and his visit there. And of course, he's right. We are created in the image of God. And God calls us the sons of God more than once in the scriptures. And verse 29 goes on, says, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped with art or man's devising. Do so you see what he's doing? He's contrasting the two now, but he's doing very tactfully. So it's not that he's skirting from the issues, and we're going to find very clearly here as we move on that it still offended a number of his listeners, and it was, still was controversial, but he's, so he's not, he's not willing to compromise the, the truth and sharing it to the point where he's willing to avoid controversy and offense at all costs, but at the same time, he's being as tactful as possible as he walks these babies in the faith, or the potential faith, through these fundamental truths. In verse 30, he finally says, as he contrasts the two, the two options of religion, that of the true God of heaven and the worship of him as the one who cares and sovereign of all things, or the different various false idols and gods that they represent. In verse 30, he goes on and says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And so again, he reveals the character of God. He says, God is a fair God. He is a just God. And so because of that, he wanted the, his listeners to know that God winks at your ignorance. In other words, he's not going to count you accountable, hold you accountable for that in which you had no opportunity to know. God is a very fair God. He is a very just God. But he says at the same time, because he is just and because he is fair, now that you know the truth, now he is calling you to repent. Now he is calling you into a better light, a higher road. And now it's up to you to be able to choose that. God never forces us, but he gives us that option. And once we know, then we are held accountable because he is just and fair as well. In verse 31, it says, Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, and now do you see the bridge? He makes his way from Genesis to the sovereignty of God in Daniel. So now he's given a Bible study on Genesis, a Bible study on Daniel, a Bible study on the Gospels of Jesus Christ, or the Gospels of God and his character, calling us to repent as Jesus and the apostles did in Israel. And now he bridges all of this over to the final judgment day, and the one who stands between us and a holy God on that judgment day, the man, Jesus Christ. And so now he's bridging over to the Son of God, Jesus himself. By the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so not only does he talk about the crucifixion, and again, verse 31, you know, to unpack that on that day, I'm sure he went into some great detail on how Jesus died on the cross as a, as a penalty and price for the sin and guilt that we all deserve and that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus has died in our place and he has now risen from the dead as our first fruits of victory over death. Well, verse 32 reveals that Paul indeed uh, offended some in spite of how effectively and tactfully he shared it. And it says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Some, some mocked in the same way that Peter and the apostles were mocked in Israel, in Jerusalem, on the streets of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Now, the interesting thing is that even though they say they will hear him again on this matter, the Bible record shows here that Paul leaves town. They never did invite him back, even though they were under deep conviction and they knew that he was on to something and they knew that they should return to it. So often people that come to an evangelistic series, a prophecy series, they're doing a set of Bible studies with a church member or a pastor and they come to different truths. They know they should come to the next Bible study. They know they should come to the next evangelistic meeting. But some of them, sadly, they never follow through with those intentions and convictions. And I believe that's what we find here. We will hear you again on this matter, but they never did invite him back again. And so Paul departed from among them. 
But verse 34 tells us that there was some fruit. It says, however, some men joined him and believed, and among them Dionysius, the Areopagite. Now, I had to look it up, you know, and what is Areopagite? I've never heard of Areopagite, have you? Um, I had a feeling it had something to do with the Areopagus because of the similarities, and sure enough, I was right. So if you're guessing that, you're right as well. Uh, an Areopagite is one of the men that made up the council of the Areopagus. And so the very ones that had invited him, the most prestigious council and group of men in Athens, becomes a born-again Christian in Jesus. And, uh, and so he accepted the truth. He accepted Jesus as Lord. He accepted the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And inevitably, he was baptized shortly after that and became a Christian. And a woman named Damaris and others with them. And so a couple are named, and then there's a few others that also came to the faith as well. Now, it's interesting that verse 8, chapter 18 follows and says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he, he departed in peace meaning that there was, he wasn't driven out. Now remember, the last two cities he was in, he was physically driven out. His own life was at stake because of the anger and the animosity of the Jews, both first in Thessalonica and then as they followed him to Berea. But now as they find him in uh, Athens, um, he's not driven out. And uh, I'm not sure if that's a good sign or a bad sign. You know, some of the people that learn the truth and then they don't accept it, but they don't get all that angry or upset either. Those are the ones I'm most concerned about because they seem to be so indifferent. Well, friends, we learned some important aspects of uh, how to win our friends. Don't forget to look up the challenge. We're out of time here today, but don't forget to look at the end of the quarterly study. There's a challenge there, which is unique for this quarter, that helps us to understand. In this case, it challenges us to pray that God will help us to understand how can we apply bridges and bring those understandings and the gospel to our neighbors, whether they're Buddhists, whether they're Roman Catholic, whether they're secular, whatever their background is, let's pray that God will help us to be able to win them in those special ways. Until we see you next week, friends, I want to pray that you have a blessed week and look forward to studying again next week. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.